This video is a final run through of all the topics assessed in paper two of AQA GCSE Physics, also known as Triple Science. There obviously isn't a huge amount of detail because I'm trying to keep it to a manageable length, but all the topics are covered. If you're taking the foundation tier, then watch out for the headers on each slide because these change colour and say higher tier only if it's a topic that you can skip. By now, this is your sixth exam, so hopefully you know all of this stuff, but make sure you're writing in black and staying inside the box. Watch out for sneaky units. Feel free to use bullet points in your longer answer questions. Remember that the command word evaluate must have a conclusion in your answer and make sure that any methods you write have a logical flow and will work. Remember, you're also going to be assessed on your working scientifically skills like identifying variables, saying whether an experiment is repeatable or reproducible, and also drawing and interpreting graphs. As well as the physics content, 30% of the marks in the physics exams are for mathematical skills like substituting and rearranging equations, standard form, significant figures, and plotting and interpreting graphs. You can find a full list of the skills in chapter seven of the specification. Although in 2024, you do have the equation sheet, remember you need to memorize the units for each quantity. Also, the sheet only contains each equation in a single format. So if you're not very confident in rearranging equations under pressure, you should memorize the rearranged versions. Within physics, we separate quantities into scalar quantities and vector quantities. Scalar quantities don't have a specific direction. They just have a magnitude or size. This includes temperature, energy, and speed. Then vector quantities are ones which have both a magnitude and a direction. This includes velocity, momentum, and also forces. Vectors, including forces, can be represented by arrows, where the length of the arrow corresponds to the size of the force and the direction tells you what direction it's acting in. We can use these to draw free body diagrams. Instead of wasting time drawing a car or a boat, we have a small circle to represent the centre of mass and then the arrows go off this, showing the forces that are acting on a particular object. Forces can also be split into contact and non-contact forces. A contact force is one that only exists if the surfaces are touching each other. A non-contact force can exist even when objects aren't touching each other, but that doesn't mean it goes away just because they are touching. You still have a weight, which is caused by gravity, even if you jump out of a plane. So weight is a non-contact force. In addition to weight, other non-contact forces include electrostatic forces, which occur between charged objects, and magnetic force, which allows magnets to attract materials that are made of iron, cobalt, and nickel. The four contact forces you should be able to name are friction, air resistance, tension, and normal contact force. Here, the book is pushing down on the table due to its weight, and then the normal contact force from the table is pushing back. Newton's third law says that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. This means that forces always come in interaction pairs. There are four things that are always true about the pair of forces. The two forces are of equal size. They must be the same type of force, so either they're both pushes or they're both pulls. They're acting in opposite directions, so the book was pushing down and the table was pushing up. And finally, they're always acting on the other object. So the book was pushing down on the table and the table was pushing back on the book. Mass tells us about how much matter or how many atoms an object is made from. So this square here is made from 56 atoms and that will determine its mass. Mass is measured in kilograms or kg for short. It isn't affected by forces and it doesn't depend on where you are. So here, just because my dino has moved between the Earth and the Moon doesn't mean his mass has changed because he's still made of the same number of atoms. Any object that enters a gravitational field has a force called weight acting on it, which is measured in Newtons or N for short. Gravity doesn't just affect planets, but the strength of a gravitational field is determined by the mass of an object. So because Earth is so much bigger than you are, Earth's gravity is about 10 to the 24 times bigger than yours. And you don't really notice yourself having gravity because the Earth's gravity is so much bigger. Now, this is important because the stronger the gravity is, the larger the weight of an object will be. And that's important because that causes changes in motion. You've probably seen videos of astronauts jumping on the moon and because their weight is smaller than on Earth, because the gravitational field strength of the moon is smaller than on Earth, they can jump higher and they can jump further. So back to our earlier point, scalar quantities don't have a direction, they only have a magnitude. So mass must be a scalar quantity, 
whereas weight is a vector quantity because your weight does have a direction. It's pulling you down towards the Earth. Weight can be measured using a piece of equipment called a Newton meter. This contains a spring which stretches as a larger force is applied, and this causes a marker to move, allowing us to read off the size of the force. An object with a bigger mass also has a bigger weight, so it will cause a, a bigger reading on the Newton meter. In fact, weight and mass are directly proportional, so as mass doubles, weight doubles too, and this means that if we plot them both on a graph, we see a straight line which passes through the origin, or zero, zero. Objects never have one single force acting on them. If we try to use all of the different forces acting on an object to predict how it's going to move, this can be quite complicated. But we can often simplify these forces into what we call resultant forces, which you can think of like an overall force. We're going to add up all the forces that are working in the same direction and subtract forces which are working in the opposite direction. And this makes it simpler for us to identify what is going to happen to an object's motion. My box here has two equal and opposite forces acting on it, so the resultant force is zero newtons, and this means that the box is going to move in exactly the same way as if there were no forces acting on it at all. In the example shown by this free body diagram, I now have two forces pulling in opposite directions. You can think of the right hand force as being made up of 60 newtons, which is opposing the left hand force, and then another 40 added on. So the overall force that's acting, the resultant force, is 40 newtons to the right. Similarly, if I have two different forces which are acting in the same direction, I can just add them together to give me the resultant force. Now for the higher tier, you may have questions where you need to draw a mathematical diagram in order to be able to interpret non-parallel forces. A question might say, I have 100 newtons of thrust for, say, an aeroplane going from west to east, and then a 50 newton wind at a 64 degree bearing. This is why you must have a protractor for your paper two physics. So to answer this, I need to draw a scale diagram. Remember that for any vector, we can draw a diagram where the length of an arrow corresponds to the magnitude of the force. So I need to pick a sensible scale. Maybe here I say 10 newtons is one centimeter. So I draw one line that was 10 centimetres long to represent my force of 100 newtons, and then I would use my protractor to measure an angle of 64 degrees, and I would draw a second line that was 5 centimetres long to represent the 50 newton force. Then these are going to be two sides of a parallelogram, <clears throat> and I'm going to draw in the other sides of the parallelogram like this, so same angles, same length sides. And then I'm going to draw a diagonal between the corners of the parallelogram. So then, as long as I've drawn this accurately, I've used my protractor, I've used a sensible scale, I can measure the length of that diagonal, and that will tell me the size of the resultant force. So here it would be 13 centimetres, and therefore my resultant force would be 130 newtons. We can also do this with forces that are acting perpendicular to one another, and it's worth pointing out that with this one in particular, it is possible to solve this using trigonometry rather than a scale diagram. But do watch out, because if the question specifically says, draw a scale diagram, and you don't, then even if you get the correct answer, you won't get all of the marks. So here we would basically go through the same process, except that our parallelogram is really just a rectangle. But again, we would draw the diagonal, measure the length of that, and we could, if we wanted to, use Pythagoras to check our answer. Now, probably the most challenging thing you can be asked to do in this topic is to do the reverse of this. So separate a diagonal force into its perpendicular components. Again, we need a scale diagram. So start off, do a little horizontal line, and then use your protractor to work out what the correct angle is and then use a sensible scale and draw the full length of the diagonal line. Then we're going to make our horizontal line the same lateral length as that diagonal, and we're going to do a vertical line that is the same height, and we're going to use those to um, use our scale and determine what the length of each of those is. In order to describe how those resultant forces will cause objects to move, we now need Newton's first and second laws of motion. The first law tells us that when the resultant force on an object is zero, acceleration is zero, meaning its motion isn't changing. So if the object is already stationary, it will stay stationary. But if it's already moving at a constant speed, it will continue to move at the constant speed. Newton's second law of motion tells us that the acceleration of the object is proportional to the resultant force acting on the object, which means that if I push it twice as hard, it will accelerate twice as much. 
and that its acceleration is inversely proportional to the mass of the object. So if I have an object that is three times heavier, then it will only accelerate by a third as much using the same force. This can be described mathematically using the equation force is mass times acceleration. So make sure that you know the units for each of these and also that you understand for the units for acceleration being meters per second squared, that squared is part of the unit. So say if the acceleration is 10 meters per second squared, you use the number 10, you don't need to square it. You should also know that acceleration is a vector. In other words, it can be a negative number and that would show you that an object was slowing down. You should have investigated this relationship as part of required practical seven using a glider which is pulled by a variety of hanging masses along an air track and you use light gates to see how quickly it's moving at each point on the air track and therefore work out the acceleration. So basically as we add more masses the weight or the force increases and therefore the glider accelerates faster. You may be asked to complete estimations about speed and acceleration and forces involved in everyday road transport. So it's worth having some idea in your head about what typical speeds would be. And bear in mind that you probably know speed limits in miles per hour rather than meters per second. So it's worth knowing there's about half a meter per second per mile per hour. It's also worth being aware that cars tend to have a mass of around 1000 kilograms and lorries tend to be about 40 times heavier than that. When a force causes an object to move through a distance, work is done on the object. So a force does work on an object when the force causes that object to be displaced. Again, you need to be familiar with all of your units because you may not be explicitly told this is the work done. When more than one force acts on an object, deformation can happen, which means changing the shape of an object. Deformed objects can be separated into those that are elastic and inelastic. Springs are elastic in nature. This means that when they're stretched by a force and then the force is removed, they return to their original length and size. Inelastic objects can be permanently deformed, so they don't return to their original size when the force is removed. In reality, a spring isn't elastic forever. Every spring has something called a limit of proportionality, and if you exert a force that is greater than that, then it won't regain its original shape. When they're squashed or stretched, springs can be used to store energy. When we do work on a spring by giving it energy, the energy is transferred into the elastic potential energy store of the spring. The amount of work done in joules equals the amount of elastic potential energy stored in joules. And this is because energy is conserved, which means it can be transferred between different stores, but it can't be made or destroyed. This energy can later be transferred to other energy stores when the spring returns to its original length. If the spring has not reached the limit of proportionality, then we can calculate how much elastic potential energy is stored in it. Remember that extension isn't the total length, it's the change in length compared to when there was no force. So we calculate it by taking the final length of the spring and subtracting the initial length of the spring before we apply the force. We can also use a mathematical relationship called Hooke's law to make predictions about how much a spring will extend by when a force is applied, or to work out what force has been applied when we know how much it's been extended by, because these are directly proportional. If I double the force applied, the extension will also double. The force applied is equal to the spring constant, which is different for every spring, multiplied by the extension. The mathematical relationship of Hooke's law will hold until the limit of proportionality is exceeded, meaning the spring will keep on stretching in a proportional way until it hits that limit, and at that point it may stretch exponentially. You may have seen this happening while investigating the required practical around Hooke's law. In this required practical, you would have had a spring suspended, probably using a clamp stand, and then you would have hung masses off it and you would have used a ruler to measure extension and probably used a newton meter to calculate the force exerted by the masses you were adding. When you did the required practical, you may have displayed your data on a graph like this, but there's one thing about this graph that is quite unusual. In science, we always put our independent variable on the x-axis and our dependent variable on the y-axis. But when you did this practical, you almost certainly hung masses with a particular weight on the spring and then only afterwards measured the extension. So why have we flipped the axes on this graph? Well, there are two reasons. One is that it's possible to do this practical the other way round. So you could stretch the spring until it's a certain length and then see what force is required to get that extension. But the other reason is a mathematical one. If we plot extension on the x-axis and force on the y-axis, then the gradient is the spring constant and that makes that calculation much easier. From this graph, we can identify where the limit of proportionality is going to be. As long as Hooke's law holds, extension and force are proportional to each other, and that means that the graph has a continuous gradient, so we have a straight line. At the point at which the line stops being straight, we've passed the limit of proportionality.
choose to plot your data with force on the x-axis and extension on the y-axis, then you need to be aware that rather than extending exponentially to the right, the graph will extend exponentially upwards when it reaches the limit of proportionality. Triple physicists need to know about moments. If you apply a force at a distance from a pivot point, then you can cause some rotation. We call that turning effect the moment, and it basically works to amplify forces. So the longer your lever is, the less force you need to achieve a desired effect. If an object, say a seesaw, isn't rotating, then this is because the clockwise and anti-clockwise moments are balanced. And we can calculate these moments by multiplying together the force and the distance. And since forces are measured in newtons and distances are measured in meters, the units for a moment are newton meters. Likewise, a simple gear system can transmit the rotational effect of forces. And if we're trying to work out how much the force is increasing or decreasing by, we can compare the number of teeth. A fluid can be either a liquid or a gas. As the particles in this liquid or gas collide, they cause a force at right angles to the surfaces of the container. And this is what causes pressure. So we can calculate this by saying pressure is force divided by area. And we can measure that in newtons per meter squared if we're just making a compound unit, or that's also known as a pascal, which is Pa. Then if we're thinking not just about the surface, but as you go down through a fluid, we can calculate the pressure at different points. Because a partially submerged object experiences greater pressure at the bottom, this generates a resultant force that we call upthrust, and this allows objects to float. The atmosphere above us exerts a pressure, and this is normally balanced because otherwise you would see people being crushed or exploding. But if we remove particles from a vessel, then the atmospheric pressure on the outside will crush it. The atmosphere also gets less dense with increasing altitude, and this means that the force is pushing the particles together reduces, so the pressure also decreases. Distance and displacement are both linked to how far you travel away from a starting point. Distance is about the number of steps that you actually take or how far your odometer would read. So if I travel from the bottom house to the house on the right and then to the house at the top, it's taken 800 metres worth of steps to do this journey and the distance is 800 metres. But displacement is about how far you would need to travel to get back to your starting point if you went in a straight line. So the displacement here is only 400 metres and that is a vector and it does have a direction. So here it would be 400 metres south. Likewise, speed and velocity may seem quite similar because they're both to do with how fast you're moving. But speed is scalar and doesn't have a direction, whereas velocity is a vector, so it does have a direction. And this means that velocity can sometimes be expressed as a negative number, and that would tell you that you're now travelling in the opposite direction to how you were travelling before. So if I run at 5 metres per second due north, and then I turn around and run at 5 metres per second due south, my speed hasn't changed because I'm still running at 5 metres per second, but my velocity has and would now be expressed as minus 5 metres per second. Although distance and speed and time do have standard international units of metres and metres per second and seconds, you should be aware that we can make other compound units for speed out of any units for distance and time. So for instance, you could be given questions where you have the distance in kilometres and the time in hours, and in that case we would measure speed in kilometres per hour. You're expected to know typical speeds for walking and running and cycling. Acceleration is another vector quantity, and it's to do with the change in velocity, but you may not be explicitly given this number, so you may need to calculate it yourself from the final velocity and the initial velocity. Remember that acceleration is a vector, so again, it has a direction, and a negative acceleration would tell you that you're actually slowing down, and of course, you need to know all of your units. There are two kinds of motion graph, and it's really important before you attempt a question that you identify whether this is a dt graph or a vt graph. Often the best way to answer these questions is not to think about a particular pattern that you've learnt, but to just look at the numbers and work it out from there. We can use these motion graphs to tell us about the motion of an object both in qualitative terms and in quantitative terms. So if we think first of all just about the general shape of a graph, for a DT graph where we have a horizontal portion, this tells us that the object is stationary because the distance shown on the y-axis hasn't changed. And if your distance hasn't changed, you're still in the same place, so you're not moving. Then if you've got a diagonal portion, then this tells us that I can see that it started out zero kilometres away and it's finished three kilometres away. So obviously it's moved. And the fact that the line is diagonal and straight tells me it's moving at a constant speed. Now, if I then look at the portion between C and D, I can see that it's now steeper. And this tells me that although it's moving at a constant speed, it's moving faster. 
Now, in terms of numerical calculations, we know that speed is distance divided by time. So at any particular point on this graph, we can use the gradient to work out what speed is. So for instance, here, I could say that we've gone from being three kilometers away to start with at C to 12 kilometers away at D. And then the time that that's taken has gone from eight hours up to 12 hours. And so if I did that calculation, I would get 2.25. And because the distance and the time are in kilometers and in hours, my speed will be in kilometers per hour, not in meters per second. If the graph curves rather than being a straight line, we know the object doesn't have a constant speed, but we can still use the same calculation to calculate the mean speed over that entire portion. If you're taking the higher tier, then you should be able to draw a tangent and use that to calculate the speed at one specific point. Remember, your most accurate calculations are going to be when your tangent is as long as it possibly can be, so don't just draw a very small one. If you're struggling to draw a tangent that is accurately tracking the graph, it's helpful to put your ruler on top of the curve rather than underneath it, and that way you'll still be able to see the curve while you're drawing. So here's my tangent, and you can see that it's just touching the graph at the time of 15 seconds. So if I want to work out the speed at exactly that point, I need to know how much does my um, tangent go up by and how much does it go along by. So first of all, I work out my change in y, and I've gone from 400 meters away to 1300 meters, so that's a change of 900, and then the time it's taken here is 25 seconds. And then actually, even if I didn't have an equation sheet, I know that my units are meters per second, in other words, meters divided by seconds. So that's what I do, and I get an answer of 36. A velocity time graph looks a lot like a distance time graph, but the difference is that instead of having distance on the y-axis, we now have velocity. So again, I think it's worth just talking yourself through what the graph is showing you. So if I look at B to C, I can see that at point B, the velocity is six meters per second, and at C, it's still six meters per second, and it's still going at the same velocity. So I can now say that the horizontal portion of the VT graph tells me that an object is moving at constant velocity. If I wanted to show that an object was stationary, not only would that line need to be horizontal, it would also need to be at zero, so going along the x-axis. If the line slopes up, this tells me that the object has positive acceleration and is speeding up, and if it's sloping downwards, then the object is slowing down, and the steeper that slope is, the faster the acceleration. So from point C to D, the object is accelerating more quickly than from A to B. If I want to calculate how far the object has traveled, then I need to calculate the area under the graph. And I can do this by using my math skills of working out the areas of rectangles and triangles. Moving objects need some time and some distance to stop. Lots of motorways have white chevrons spaced 40 meters apart, and cars are supposed to have two of them between them to ensure that they can safely do an emergency stop, which will need about 80 meters. Stopping distance is made up of thinking distance and braking distance. Thinking distance is the distance travelled by the vehicle during the driver's reaction time. So not really while they're thinking about whether or not they want to stop, but during the amount of time that it takes for that signal to get to the brain and then get down to their foot. Then the braking distance is the distance travelled by the vehicle while it's under the braking force, so while the driver's foot is on the brake pedal trying to stop. Here are some typical thinking and braking distances for cars travelling at different speeds. Your reaction time is the time taken for a signal from your brain to reach your muscles, and it varies from person to person from about 0.2 to 0.9 seconds. You'll have measured this as part of the biology required practical in the homeostasis topic. Reaction time can be increased by tiredness, drugs, alcohol, and also just by being distracted. Thinking distance will be increased by anything which increases your reaction time. So we've just mentioned tiredness, drugs, alcohol and distractions. But thinking distance is also affected by the speed at which you're traveling, because the faster you're moving, the more distance your car will cover before that nerve signal reaches your muscles in order for them to break. The link between speed and thinking distance is directly proportional. So at 30 miles an hour, thinking distance is 9 metres. And if we double the speed to 60 miles an hour, the thinking distance becomes 18, which is also doubled. If we plot speed and thinking distance on a graph, then we get a straight line graph which passes through the origin, 0, 0. If we now look at braking distance, we can see that the same thing isn't true, and this isn't a directly proportional relationship. If we consider the braking distances at 30 miles an hour and 60 miles an hour, we can see that the braking distance at 60 miles an hour is nearly four times larger, even though the speed has only just doubled. So we can say that an increase in speed affects the braking distance much more than it affects the thinking distance. One reason for this is the amount of kinetic energy that the car has when it's moving that quickly. 
If we take a car with a mass of 1,000 kilograms and say it's moving at a velocity of 10 meters per second, then it has 50,000 joules of kinetic energy and it needs to lose that kinetic energy in order to come to a stop. But if I have the same car and I drive it at a velocity of 20 meters a second, then it actually has four times as much energy that it needs to get rid of. When we're trying to explain this, we can say that a car traveling at a faster velocity has more kinetic energy, so therefore more work has to be done in order to stop the car. And when a force is applied to the brakes, the work is done by the friction force between the brakes and the wheel. We can calculate the size of the work by looking at the force and the distance. This also helps to explain why braking at high speeds can be dangerous because it can lead the brakes to overheat, because the work done by the friction force, although it's reducing the kinetic energy, will raise the temperature of the brakes. And so if the braking force is too large, the brakes may overheat and the car may skid. We've described that travelling at high speed affects the thinking distance, but it will also affect the braking distance. The car travelling at higher speed has more kinetic energy, so more work needs to be done in order to bring it to a stop. So if we assume the braking force is constant, then a longer distance is required in order to bring it to a stop. Additionally, braking distance is going to be affected by wet or icy weather, and also by the condition of the tyres and the brakes. It's easy to calculate a numerical value for momentum, but what actually is it? You can think of momentum as unstoppability or oomph, and we define it as the tendency of an object to keep moving in the same direction. Heavier objects have more momentum, and faster objects have more momentum too. So if we put these together, then we can get our equation for momentum. And if you know the units for mass and velocity, you can also put those together to work out the units for momentum. You need to know that stationary objects don't have any momentum at all. In a closed system, momentum is conserved. In other words, the total momentum before an event is the same as after the event. This is true in a closed system, which means that over the course of the event, no matter and no energy gets in or out. We can use this information to make predictions about collisions and also explosions. If I know that my first roller skater has a mass of 75 kilograms and a velocity of 4.2 meters per second, then I can calculate that initially her momentum is 315 kilogram meters per second. Now, when she collides with the second roller skater, that same amount of momentum needs to be split between the two of them. In other words, they're not going to stop dead, they're both going to carry on moving. But because the momentum is split between the two of them, they're now going to move at a slower velocity than the initial roller skater was moving on her own. So let's say that I know that my second roller skater has a mass of 65 kilograms. That means that the two roller skaters together have masses of 140. So that total momentum is now going to be split between 140 kilograms. And therefore, we can solve this to show that their final velocity is 2.25 meters per second. Don't forget that momentum is a vector, so it can have a negative value to show you that we're moving in the opposite direction. And this is important for us to be able to explain explosions. When we say explosion, we're not necessarily talking about a bomb. We could just be talking about two objects moving away from each other. But if you visualise that bomb, for a second before it explodes, it has a momentum of zero because it's not moving. But at the end of the situation, obviously things are moving. The reason is that as long as you have something moving to the right with the same amount of momentum as something moving to the left, then the positive and negative momentum still add up to zero. So if our roller skaters now push off each other, we can work out that our friend on the left has total momentum of 975 kilogram meters per second, and therefore our roller skater on the right must have minus 975. It doesn't matter which one's positive and negative, it's just arbitrary. So if I solve my momentum equation for my right hand one, I can now see that she's going to have a velocity of minus 15 meters per second. In other words, she's going at 15 meters per second, but in the opposite direction to her friend. It's important when describing car safety features to do this in terms of momentum. You don't get marks in the exam for saying that a seatbelt keeps you safe because it stops you going through the windscreen. In a car crash, all of the momentum of the vehicle must be dissipated, and the amount of momentum it has is influenced by its mass and how fast it's travelling. Then the force felt is determined by how long that momentum takes to dissipate, so longer time means smaller force. In the process of the crumple zone crumpling, the car takes longer to come to a full stop than it would otherwise. And this longer time means that the force felt is smaller and it reduces the risk of a serious injury to the driver.
If you go face first into an airbag rather than the steering wheel or the dashboard, then it's going to take you a longer time to slow down because the airbag has a bit of give in it. And that means that the force exerted on the driver is going to be smaller. And so again, we're going to reduce the chance of injury. The important thing about seat belts is not that they hold you back because so would a metal bar. It's that actually they don't hold you back completely. They're made of fabric and they have a mechanism that allows them to stretch slightly. Not enough for you to go headfirst into the dashboard, but that slight stretch means that you actually carry on moving forward for a slightly longer amount of time. So because the change of momentum is still the same, um, but the time is increased, the size of the force that you feel is reduced and therefore there's a lower chance of you having a serious or fatal injury. Unit six is the waves topic, and we start off by saying that waves can be either transverse or longitudinal. In a transverse wave, the oscillation of the wave is perpendicular to the direction in which the wave is traveling. In a longitudinal wave, the direction of the wave and the direction of the oscillation are parallel to one another, so they're going in the same direction. The ripples on the surface of water are an example of a transverse wave. Longitudinal waves show areas of compression, where the particles are close together, and rarefaction, where they're spread out. And sound waves travelling through air are an example of a longitudinal wave. You should be able to label a transverse wave. We start out with the undisturbed position or the equilibrium position and onto that we can draw our transverse wave. On this I can label the peaks which are the highest points and the troughs which are the lowest points and once I put in these I can add wavelengths. The wavelength of a wave is the distance between two equivalent points on two adjacent waves. I can draw the wavelength from peak to peak but I can also go from trough to trough. You could technically go from one of the middle points of the wave, but it's really easy if you do that to accidentally only label half the wave, so I would not recommend it. The one that people tend to get wrong is amplitude. Remember that amplitude is half the height of the wave. It's the maximum displacement of the wave from the undisturbed position. You also have to identify the frequency of a wave. So if this box represents one second with three waves inside it, three waves have passed a point within a second, so the frequency is three hertz. Linked to this is period. The period is the time taken for one wave. So if I've managed to fit three waves into one second, then the period is going to be one divided by three. In other words, a third of a second. You should also be able to calculate wave speed from frequency and wavelength, and just make sure that you're familiar with all of the units for these quantities. Required practical eight is about making measurements of waves, either in a ripple tank or by looking at a string with a signal generator attached. There are lots of different ways that they could set up a question about this, but a typical one would be to ask you how to collect data that you could use to calculate wave speed, in which case you're going to need the wavelength and also the frequency. Wavelength is literally a length, so you can measure it with a ruler. If we're thinking about the ripple tank, then the places where the peak of the wave is have more water underneath them, so less light gets through and there's a darker stripe, and then where the trough is, there's less water and it looks lighter, so you can measure it that way. Now these waves are moving, but that makes them quite challenging to measure. So a typical way to do this would be to place your ruler alongside the ripple tank and take a photograph that includes that ruler, and then you can measure the wave on the picture. One thing you can do to make your data more precise is rather than just measuring from one peak to the next, measuring say 10 waves in one go and then dividing that length by 10. Next, you need to be, think about the frequency. Now, the normal way to use a ripple tank is to have some signal generator which causes a metal or wooden rod to bounce up and down and create the waves. And often that will have a screen and you can just say, I want a frequency of 10 hertz, in which case you can read the frequency off there. But if that's not available to you, what you can do is pick a point and then count how many waves go past per second. And just like with wavelength, we're going to be more accurate if we measure over a greater time. So say you could say how many waves went past in 60 seconds and then divide that answer by 60. Once you have those two pieces of information, you can put them together to work out the wave speed. Alternatively, if say it's frequency you're being asked to calculate, you're going to need the wave speeds. So the way that you would get that is you have your ruler alongside the ripple tank and you measure the time for one wave to travel the length of the tank by using a stop clock and then you use velocity is distance divided by time, so the length of the tank divided by the time it took. Electromagnetic waves are transverse waves that transfer energy from the source of the waves to an absorber. All types of EM wave travel at the same velocity through a vacuum or through air. Electromagnetic waves form a continuous spectrum. In other words, there isn't something fundamentally different about a radio wave and an infrared wave. We just give them slightly different names depending on their particular frequency and wavelength. It's a bit like how in the rainbow there isn't one set point where red turns into orange. 
we just give the colour a different name depending on its wavelength. Going from long to short wavelength or low to high frequency, the groups of waves are radio waves, microwaves, infrared radiation, visible light, ultraviolet, x-rays and gamma rays. And within that visible light portion, we start with red wavelengths, which are longer wavelengths. You can think that infrared goes next to red and then we finish up with violet colours next to ultraviolet. Our eyes only detect visible light, so we only detect a limited range of those electromagnetic waves. Different substances can absorb electromagnetic radiation, in other words, take it in and not give it back. They can transmit it so that it passes straight through them. They can refract it so it changes direction as it passes through them, or they can reflect it so it bounces back. And the way in which they do this may depend on the wavelength. If you just think about the visible portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, if you have a red object, then that red object reflects red wavelengths of light, but it absorbs all the other wavelengths of visible light. Some of these effects like refraction are due to differences in the velocity of the waves in different substances. In other words, the wave is traveling at a different speed if it's in a substance with a different density, and that's going to affect how it's refracted. Waves can be reflected at the boundary between two different materials, and you need to be able to construct a ray diagram to show this, normally using just a plain flat mirror. The first thing that you need to draw is the normal. This is the imaginary construction line at the point where the wave is going to meet the change in media, and it's going to sit at 90 degrees to that surface. Then we can draw in the instant ray, and the angle of incidence is measured between that instant ray and the normal. The way I always think about this is there wouldn't have been any point in me drawing the normal if I wasn't going to use it. Then we can draw in the reflected ray and the angle of reflection. And the key thing here is that um, where we've got a smooth flat surface, the angle of incidence is going to be equal to the angle of reflection. Reflection from a smooth surface in a single direction, which is what happens when light hits a mirror like this or a puddle, is called specular reflection. And you can see here all of my light is coming in at the same angle of incidence and it's leaving at the same angle of reflection because the surface is flat. So that's specular reflection and that's what allows us to see what we call a reflection. Um, whereas when you have a um, rough surface, this causes scattering. So this is diffuse reflection, and this basically happens because even though all the light is coming in from the same direction, because the surface is rough, it's actually hitting at different angles, and therefore the reflected rays are going in different ways, and so you don't get a single clear image. So that's diffuse reflection. You also need to be able to construct a ray diagram which shows how a wave is refracted at the boundary between two different media, and the typical example in school is a light wave going from the air into a glass block. Again, we start with a normal and then we draw in the instant ray and the angle of incidence. Now, if there wasn't any refraction taking place at all, my light would carry on along this path because light travels in straight lines. But what actually happens is something a little bit more like this. My glass block is denser than the air that the light started off in. And when light enters a denser medium, it refracts towards the normal. So that's what we see here. And then to come out of it, I would draw another normal. And this time we're going from the denser material to the less dense material. So my light is going to refract away from the normal. Different wavelengths of light refract by different amounts. So inside this block, the red and the blue light are behaving in a slightly different way. Now, because this is a rectangular block, the two sides of the block are parallel to each other. And that means that whatever happens when the light enters the block, the exact opposite thing will happen when it leaves. So even though they're split apart in the middle, when the light exits the block, it does so as one beam of white light. But that's not the case if you take something like this triangular prism, because as the light enters the block, the red light and the blue light refract differently from each other. And that means that when they hit the far side of the block, they're doing so at different angles. And so even though they do refract back to where they were, they don't actually form up to form a single beam anymore. We get this spectrum instead. So the reason that this refraction happens is that as the wave enters the more dense medium, it slows down. Now, if the wave was traveling perpendicular to the surface that it's passing through, then the whole wave front slows down equally. So the whole light ray slows down and then speeds up together and you don't see the refraction. But where it hits the change in medium at an angle, it basically pivots around that point. Sound waves are longitudinal and they can travel through solids causing vibrations in the solid. And this happens more quickly in a solid than a liquid or a gas because the particles are much closer together. Within your ear, the sound waves cause the eardrum and other parts to vibrate, and that's how you detect the sound.
The conversion of sound waves to vibration of solids works over a limited frequency range, and this means that we can only hear sounds that are between 20 hertz and 20,000 hertz. Ultrasound waves have a frequency that's higher than the upper limit of hearing for humans. They're partially reflected when they meet a boundary between two different media, and the time taken for that reflection to reach a detector can be used to work out how far away that boundary is. And this allows ultrasound to be used for medical imaging and also for industrial imaging. Ultrasound can be used to find cracks in metal objects such as pipes and also to measure the thickness of the objects by looking at ultrasound being reflected from both surfaces. But it's also commonly used for imaging, both medical imaging like prenatal scanning, but also things like identifying where the seafloor is. When a pulse of ultrasound passes through lots of different materials, the returning echoes can be recorded and those reflections from the different layers come back at different times from different depths. The depth of each structure is calculated using distance is speed times time, and that's going to give you the total distance travelled by the wave, both going out and coming back. So we then need to half that number to find out how far away the boundary was. So all of this data is then used to build up an image of the different layers in the internal structure. Earthquakes produce a type of wave called a seismic wave. There are two types of these, which can be detected using a piece of equipment called a seismometer. The two types are called P for pressure waves and S for shear waves, and the P waves are longitudinal and the S waves are transverse. Studying seismic waves can give us evidence for the structure of the Earth. So the longitudinal P waves are able to travel through both solids and liquids, and so they're able to go straight through the Earth's core and be detected on the other side. They do refract as they go into the core, but in the same way as we saw with that rectangular block, they'll correct that refraction as they come out of the core, and so therefore they do get through to the other side. In contrast to this, the S waves, which are transverse, can't pass through liquids, so they're not detected on the other side of the planet, and therefore we have a larger shadow zone where we don't see the S waves, and that helps us to prove that the Earth's core is liquid. We can also analyse S and P waves from different earthquakes to show the depth of the Earth where the P waves are refracted and the S waves are stopped. The next required practical is about investigating how the amount of infrared radiation that's absorbed or radiated by a surface depends on the nature of that surface. That could be about the surface type, like is it shiny or matte, or whether the colour makes a difference. In order to test this, you need a number of identical cans or hollow metal cubes. They need to have the same dimensions but different surfaces, which is the independent variable. Everything else that could be changed needs to be kept the same. You fill the cans or cubes with hot water from the same kettle, so they're starting at the same temperature, and then you use a ruler to position an infrared detector at a consistent distance away from the can. You can also take the temperature of the water as a surrogate for this, because if the can's radiating more infrared, then its temperature will drop faster, but the data just isn't as valid. If you're taking higher tier, then you need to know that radio waves can be produced by oscillations in electrical circuits. When radio waves are then absorbed by an aerial, they create an alternating current, and that alternating current has the same frequency as the radio wave. Changes in atoms and in the nuclei of atoms can result in electromagnetic waves being generated or absorbed over quite a wide frequency range, and you already know from Unit 4 in Paper 1 that gamma rays originate from changes in the nucleus of an atom. Electromagnetic radiation can cause hazards, but how hazardous it is depends on both the type of radiation and also the dose. Obviously, if you're exposed to a larger dose, then the hazard is higher. Infrared radiation is transferred from hot objects, so you can be burned by it. But UV radiation also causes skin to age prematurely, which is why you get wrinkly if you use tanning beds, and it also increases the risk of skin cancer. Both X-rays and gamma rays are ionising, and this can lead to the mutation of DNA and ultimately cancer. Electromagnetic waves are really useful, and you need to know what each portion of the spectrum is used for. Radio waves are used for television and radio broadcasting. Microwaves can be used for satellite communications and cooking in a microwave oven. Infrared radiation is used in electrical heaters to cook food and in infrared cameras, which can detect body heat for things like manhunts in the dark when the police are chasing someone. Visible light is used in fibre optic communication like broadband. Ultraviolet is used in energy efficient lamps and in suntan beds. And X-rays and gamma rays are used in medical imaging and also in treatments like radiotherapy. A lens is a curved piece of glass that forms an image by refracting light. There are two main types. A concave lens is shaped like you're going into a cave and a convex lens is the other one which bulges outwards. 
Usually in school, we actually use biconcave and biconvex lenses, which are the same on both sides. And that's what the exam board expects you to use. But for some reason, we just still call them concave and convex. Now, depending on the shape of the lens, it will do different things to the light that passes through it. And we can represent what happens using ray diagrams. And for these, we need some symbols. A convex lens looks like an arrow. And I like to remember that if I extended these arrowheads, then I could draw an accurate picture of the lens. And then a concave lens is basically just backwards. All of these ray diagrams are going to have a few things in common. So I'm going to have my lens in the centre represented by the appropriate symbol. I'm going to have my principal axis cutting through the middle of that lens. And I'm going to have my object, which is the thing I'm looking at through the lens. Um, so then I'm going to have um, what's called the focal point, which is where the light is refracting through. And the distance between that focal point and the lens is called the focal length. So in all of these diagrams, I'm going to focus on what two kinds of light are doing. So one is going to be a beam that is parallel to the principal axis, and that is going to then refract through the focal point. And then in the instance that I've got here, I'm also going to have um, a diagonal line that goes from the top of the object right the way through the centre of the lens and back out again. Now, where those two um, rays of light intersect, that's where my image is going to be. So the thing that I actually see. A concave lens doesn't make the light focus, it actually kind of unfocuses it. So if I had parallel rays coming through, then they would spread out like this in such a way as if they had come from that focal point. Now, if I want to draw the ray diagram, I'm just going to take one of those. So I'll take the one from the top of my object. And then again, I'm going to put in um, that line that goes right through the diagonal, through the middle of the lens. And I'm going to end up with my image being this tiny little image just down here. Visible light is the part of the EM spectrum that we can see, and the different colours are caused by the light having different wavelengths, from something like 450 nanometers for blue light up to 750 nanometers for red light. When we think of an object as having a colour, that is due to the wavelengths of light that it reflects. So if an object only reflected light with a wavelength of 450 nanometers, i.e. blue light, then it would look blue. If the object reflects all the lights, so that's red, blue and green, remember the primary colours for light are different to paint, then it looks white. If an object doesn't reflect light and it just lets it all pass through it, then we say it's transparent. And if it lets some light through, then it's translucent. A colour filter will only let certain kinds of light through. So a red filter only lets red light through. That means if you look through a red filter at objects, everything will either appear red if it was reflecting red light already or black if it was blue or green. All objects, regardless of their temperature, emit and absorb infrared radiation, and the hotter something is, the more infrared radiation it radiates in a given time. A perfect black body is an object that absorbs all of the radiation that is incident on it, and it doesn't reflect or transmit any radiation. Since a good absorber is also a good emitter, a perfect black body would be the best possible emitter. The temperature of an object, even one as big as the Earth, is a function of how quickly it's absorbing and emitting that radiation. So if it's doing both at the same rate, then it stays the same temperature, and if it's absorbing more, then it's going to heat up. The poles of a magnet are the places where the magnetic forces are strongest. When two magnets are brought close together, they exert a non-contact force on each other. Two like poles repel each other, and two unlike poles attract each other. A permanent magnet produces its own magnetic field. In contrast, an induced magnet is a material that becomes a magnet when it's placed in a magnetic field. Induced magnetism always causes a force of attraction. When removed from the magnetic field, an induced magnet loses most or all of its magnetism quickly.
The region around a magnet where a force acts on another magnet or a magnetic material like iron, steel, cobalt and nickel is called the magnetic field. The force between a magnet and a magnetic material is always one of attraction. The strength of the magnetic field depends on the distance from the magnet and the field is strongest at the poles. The direction of the magnetic field at any point is given by the direction of the force that would act on another north pole placed at that point. The direction of a magnetic field line is from the north seeking pole of a magnet to the south seeking pole of the magnet. A magnetic compass contains a small bar magnet. The earth has a magnetic field. The compass needle points in the direction of the earth's magnetic field. When a current flows through a conducting wire, a magnetic field is produced around the wire. The strength of the magnetic field depends on the current through the wire and the distance from the wire. Shaping a wire to form a solenoid increases the strength of the magnetic field created by the current through the wire. The magnetic field inside a solenoid is strong and uniform. The magnetic field around a solenoid has a similar shape to that of a bar magnet, and adding an iron core will increase the strength of that magnetic field. An electromagnet is just a solenoid that has an iron core. If you take a conductor with a current flowing through it and place it in a magnetic field, then the magnet and the conductor exert a force on each other. The reason this works is that as long as there's a current flowing through the conductor, it has its own magnetic field too. So the two magnetic fields are interacting, causing attraction or repulsion, and therefore the conductor ends up moving. This is called the motor effect, and we predict which way the interaction is going to happen and which direction the conductor is going to move using Fleming's left hand rule. Hold out your left hand with your first and second fingers at 90 degrees to each other, and then your thumb going up also in 90 degrees. Your first finger represents the direction of the magnetic field, which goes from north where your hand is to south at the end of your finger. Your second finger represents the current, and it's important to remember that the direction is conventional current, so we're going from plus at your hand to minus at the end of your finger. And then your thumb shows you the direction of the movement or the force. The idea is that if you know the direction of the field and the current, you can predict the direction of the movement or vice versa. A typical exam question might ask you to predict the direction of the movement or to explain why it happens. So you need to mention that the wire has a current flowing through it and therefore it has a magnetic field and that the magnetic field around the wire interacts with the magnetic field of the permanent magnet. And so because of the interaction of those two magnetic fields, there is a force acting on the wire. A motor is made from a coil of wire carrying current in a magnetic field. Here's my coil of wire, and as you can see, there's a current moving around it, always from positive to negative, and this is placed in a magnetic field, made either from a sort of U-shaped magnet or from two separate static magnets, so we have north and south. This is going to cause that coil of wire to rotate, and in order to make this rotation continue always in one direction, rather than flip-flopping back and forth between it, we need a split ring commutator. When the motor's turned on, the coil of wire is experiencing the motor effect, but because the current is moving around in a circle, on the left side of my coil it's moving away from me and on the right side it's moving towards me, the, felt, the force felt by the two sides of the coil is going to be opposite to each other. So the left side is going to be pushed down, whereas the right side is going to be pushed up, and this leads to rotation. Loudspeakers and headphones use the motor effect to convert variations in current in electrical circuits into the pressure variations that make up sound waves. So a current in the coil creates a magnetic field, and this interacts with the permanent magnet generating a force, which pushes the cone outwards, and the current is made to flow in the opposite direction. If an electrical conductor moves relative to a magnetic field, or if there's a change in the magnetic field, then a potential difference is induced across the ends of the conductor. If the conductor is part of a complete circuit, then a current is induced in the conductor, and this is called the generator effect. An induced current generates a magnetic field that opposes the original change, and either the movement of the conductor or the change in magnetic field is opposed. An alternating current generator, also known as an alternator, is a device that produces an alternating potential difference. A simple alternator consists of a coil of wire rotating in a magnetic field, so it looks very similar to a motor, but whereas with a motor we're producing the motion, with the alternator we're putting in the motion and we're causing the current to flow. In a dynamo, we still have a coil of wire rotating in a fixed magnetic field, but this time the coil of wire is connected to a split ring commutator, which reverses the direction of the current. The induced potential difference is largest when the coil and the magnetic field are parallel to each other, in which case the coil will cut across the magnetic field at the fastest rate, but the potential difference will be zero when the coil is perpendicular to the magnetic field.
microphones use the generator effect in the opposite way to a speaker. So the sound waves that hit the microphone make a coil inside a magnet vibrate, and that coil vibrates at the same frequency as the sound wave coming in, inducing a potential difference and current in the coil. A transformer is a device that can change the potential difference of an alternating current supply, so this only works with AC. A step-up transformer increases the potential difference, and a step-down transformer reduces the potential difference. The transformer is made from a soft iron core because iron is easily magnetized and can carry the magnetic field from the primary coil to the secondary coil. And there are two coils of insulated wire wrapped around that core called the primary coil, which is where our original AC is flowing, and then the secondary coil, which is going to take the newly stepped up or stepped down AC supply away. The ratio of potential differences on the transformer coils matches the ratio of the number of turns on the coils. So if you double the number of coils, you double the potential difference like we have here. When the transformer is in operation, the potential difference in the primary coil causes the original AC current. This induces a magnetic field, which switches direction as the current changes direction, and the iron core increases the strength of that field. That changing magnetic field induces a changing potential difference in the secondary coil and the induced potential difference produces an alternating current in the external circuit. Now if we had 100% efficiency the power on the two sides of the transformer would be the same and since power is current times by potential difference we know that if we double the potential difference we will halve the current. The universe contains hundreds of millions of galaxies. We are in the Milky Way galaxy and each galaxy contains lots of stars. Our particular star is the Sun, and it has a solar system containing four smaller rocky planets called Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. And then further away from the Sun, we have the gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. Several of these planets, including Earth, have moons, which are natural satellites. In addition to the planets and the moons, there are also comets, which orbit the Sun. We don't have to go very far back in history to find a time when people didn't know what the structure of the solar system was, and instead they thought about something called the geocentric model, which had Earth at the centre of things. So in the geocentric model, we still had circular orbits and the moon orbiting Earth, and there was just the one star. But instead of all the rest of the planets going around the sun, they were going around Earth, and none of these planets had their moons. And also some of the planets that we know exist today hadn't been discovered yet. The reason that we changed our model is that people made new observations and had new evidence. Our sun, like all stars, was formed from a cloud of dust and gas called a nebula, which was pulled together by gravity. This leads to a protostar, and then gradually nuclear fusion happens, converting hydrogen into helium, and the protostar turns into a main sequence star. And this is where the star is stable, because the gravity pulling the star in is balanced by the outward acting forces of gas pressure and radiation pressure. For a small star like our sun, at the end of its life, it starts to run out of the hydrogen that it's fusing into helium, and then it starts to cool and expand. This gives us a red giant, which is up to a thousand times bigger than the original star. As a red giant, it can fuse heavier elements to make even heavier elements, but eventually it runs out of fuel completely and then shrinks right down, causing it to heat up again and become white hot. So this is called a white dwarf. Eventually, this white dwarf will also cool down to become a black dwarf. Now we also have bigger stars and the start of their life cycle is the same. It starts as a nebula and becomes a protostar and a main sequence star, just bigger. So this bigger star will rapidly burn through its fuel and burn hotter. And then in a similar way, it runs out of fuel and it becomes a red supergiant. Then the force of gravity pulls everything in, but even more so than it did with a small star. So the star completely collapses and basically rebounds in a massive explosion called a supernova. During this, the really heavy elements like gold are scattered throughout the universe, and actually they could eventually form another nebula and be present in a new star. Now, there are two possible outcomes for the supernova. One is that the atoms get squished so that the protons and electrons end up joining up to make neutrons, and all of the mass of the star is contained in something about the size of a teaspoon, and that's a neutron star. Or the whole thing collapses even further to make a black hole. That black hole can't be seen because the gravity is too strong for even light to escape, so we only know it's there because of the impact it has on other objects nearby. Gravity is really important if we want to talk about the orbits of planets and other things like comets. So if we think about something like Earth that has a roughly circular orbit, it's moving at rapid speed and its speed isn't changing, but the gravity is causing the planet to constantly change direction, and so its velocity is changing even though its speed is not. Now, comets, on the other hand, typically have an elliptical orbit, not circular, so something different must be happening. 
As the comet gets closer to the sun, it loses potential energy, which is converted to kinetic energy. And this means it speeds up as it gets closer to the sun, and then it's basically slingshotted around the sun and moves away and slows down again. Something called redshift provides significant evidence for the Big Bang. Essentially, when we look at distant stars, we see that the further away they are, the redder the light from them appears to be. And this tells us that the light has a longer wavelength than expected. And this is what happens when a wave is moving away from you. You're probably familiar with it in terms of the sound that an ambulance or a race car makes as it passes you, and then we call it the Doppler effect. But in terms of light, it's called redshift, and it tells us that these stars are moving away from us and therefore that the universe is expanding. So if we extrapolate backwards from there, we can say that actually a bit less than 14 billion years ago, all of the matter in the universe was in one place in a point called a singularity, and then the Big Bang took everything outwards from there. Finally, we don't know all of the answers. Technology is getting better, telescopes are getting better, but there are still plenty of things like dark matter and dark energy that we just don't know about yet. So that's it for AQA GCSE Physics Paper 2. I really hope that this video helped you to feel a bit more confident. If you haven't already, watch the Morning of Physics Paper 2 video for some last minute tips. I'm wishing you so much luck for your exams, so just go and nail it.